So I am starting a new series, and it's going to go all the way up into Advent, uh, the birth of Christ, Christmas season. Um, and I titled this series, Into the Mystery, Into the Mystery. And really what this means is, is Paul uses that word over and over and over. He uses the word mystery in the New Testament. And sometimes that's really hard for us because we are Americans, <laughs> and we love everything boom, 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 boom. And then when it doesn't happen that way, sometimes we get upset at God, or we wonder where God is at. And this faith is a mystery. It really is. It doesn't mean that there isn't fact. It doesn't mean that uh, there isn't archaeology. It doesn't mean that there isn't proof. But it just means that um, there, if, if we're studying the God of the cosmos, Jesus Christ, the, the maker of the cosmos, and we're these little finite people just here for a blip, a mist, it says in the Psalms, that there is this exercise that we need to do to seek God. Like, we're never done seeking God. We're never going to get this totally, like, in line perfectly to line up, it, it, and that takes all the fun out of it. Following Jesus is a mystery. Following Christ is not just saying the sinner's prayer or just a one-time thing. It's a lifetime of knowledge. It's a lifetime of understanding this. And so I want you to look at this as not as something scary. This is a really unique opportunity, especially if, if you're a person and, and you didn't grow up in church or uh, you haven't been to church in a long time and, and you're just kind of one of those people that says like, well, I don't really know anything. You're actually in the best spot because we are now in a generation of people who, I mean, I meet you, I meet people all the time who said they've never stepped foot in a church. I can tell you that's actually a good thing sometimes because you don't bring a lot of the religious baggage and a lot of the, some of these traditions that don't necessarily line up with the faith handed down to us. So this is an opportunity for you, but this is also an opportunity for you who might have grown up in church in different denominations and all those different things to really get down and see what's important in our faith. The faith handed down to us. Because here's what you need to realize sometimes. Like, I always like to use this example. <laughs> if I went back in a time machine, a DeLorean, a 1985 DeLorean, back to the future, uh, and I went 200 years ago, and I walked up to somebody on the streets of Missoula, you know, the 1800s, and they were wearing totally different clothes, looked totally different culture, whatever it is, and I said to them, man, those cowboy boots are sweet. <laughs> They'd look at me like, is this guy gonna eat these or what's happening, right? Like they'd have no clue what I'm talking about. And so sometimes in the Christian faith, we try to take this, this good news, we try to take the culture of them and we look at it through our lens and we have to do the opposite. We have to go back 2,000 years ago to understand what this really was and understand the language, understand the poetry, uh, the uh, uh, apocalyptic hyperbole, and that is one of the hard things with the American faith is we're always looking at it through our lens. We need to look at it through their lens. So there are some things that are just kind of off that have been, that I like to say, muddied the waters a little bit that we need to see in a journey and what the faith actually was that was given to us by the apostles and the early church fathers. And that's really what I've been studying for the last few years. I love this verse that uh, Andrea read, Ephesians 3. He says, so that the multifaceted wisdom of God that's why I keep telling you that for, for too long in the church, we've been told not to use our brains or don't trust our feelings or don't trust this. It's like, if we have the spirit of God, there's a wisdom that comes with that and we need to seek that out. The wisdom of God might be made known through the church, think about that, through the church, to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. I want boldness and confidence in this faith through Christ. And I believe that mystery, that seeking, is actually what brings that confidence out. It's not this rigid religion. It's not this one through 10 theology. It's understanding and, and getting to know for all eternity the greatness of the God who created the cosmos. And that's really what we're gonna be exploring. Like I said, that's what I've been exploring for the last five years, really. I almost, I had to go back to school, in a sense. Um, and, that's, and I'm into it. I understand that some of you might not be into this. You're like, you know what? I don't really care about this theology stuff. I just wanna come, like, like hear the love of God. Well, you're gonna get that. You're gonna get that. I understand all of our brains work differently, too. We all have different personalities. 
But this is incredibly important to not just say, well, I got this all figured out. Because that's, that's just not how this works. I wish it did, but it's not how it works. And I wanna just start with a quick story about my grandpa. My grandfather was my spiritual father. Um, my, my father was a great guy, but he, wasn't, he didn't claim to be a Christian, and, and he taught me a lot of life things, and he was a loving dad, but he didn't really teach me about God. My grandfather taught me about God. My grandfather had four sons, and he, three of them died, two of cancer and one in a car accident. And my grandpa kept the faith. I never heard him doubt or be angry at God that entire time. A year ago, my grandfather passed away. And unfortunately, one of our last conversations was a fight. It was a fight. Somebody from his church here in town went to my grandfather's house and told him that he needs to talk to me because I'm a heretic. I'm a heretic. They never came to me, but they literally went to my grandfather's house to tell them that I'm a heretic and he needs to talk to me. And so I, I went over there and I wasn't even expecting it and my grandpa just unloads on me. And it was ugly because then I fired back and I ended up storming out of the house and it was just, it was just this really ugly scene. And you know, standing up for Christ while acting unchristlike, right? It's what we love to do. He called me that night and left a long, long message that I have kept. I saved it and I listened to it just so I can hear his voice sometimes. <clears throat> but he apologized. And I went back the next day and he confessed to me that he does not believe in eternal hell. And he hasn't for a long time. That he was an annihilationist, that he believed, and if you're new with us, I did a whole series on hell, and I talked about the three different views of hell, and that he was an annihilationist, and he just believes that people who reject Christ, um, they pay for their sins, and then they just don't exist anymore. He's not gonna torture them for all eternity. And I asked him, I was like, why have you never told anybody that? It's because he was afraid. He was afraid of church people. He, he, and he should have been. I've seen it, the viciousness over theology. And he was afraid to give his point of view, even though his point of view was incredibly valid according to the scriptures, but then he couldn't be an elder and he pretty much would have got disowned by his church. And I thought right then, I am not going to do that. I am not going to do that. I'm here to turn a corner now. I have put in the work. I have thousands and thousands of hours of reading through tears, through prayer, through confession. I have put in the work. And I have looked at the early church and the faith handed down to us. And then I've looked at the church 2,000 years later. And I'm sorry, but something's off. Something's off. And so I'm no longer gonna like defend this, defend myself. I'm going to tell you what I believe. And you can stick around. I hope you do. But it's time that I move forward in what I believe. But here's the thing. You have to put in the work too. <laughs> For me to come here and just give you a sermon every week, that doesn't make you a theologian, my friends. Me studying the Greek, me studying the Hebrew, doesn't make you a theologian. You have to put in the work yourself. You have to find the discovery yourself. And so I'm gonna be giving out certain books. You have to read them. And my, I'm totally open for conversation. I just got some great emails this week from someone who listened to the Hellology series. They wanna dig deeper. I love that, that's what I'm about. But you have to put in the work. And so right now, this, the first book we're gonna do is called Speaking of Jesus, The Art of Unevangelism. And it's a guy who was a missionary in the Middle East and he realized a lot of our evangelistic tools is not the way we're supposed to be doing it. We're just supposed to show the love of Jesus to people. And that sparks the conversation. Your job is not to save anyone because you can't save yourself. And Jesus never once told us to go save people. He never said, okay, hand them a track and just get them down the Romans road and then they'll get it. He says, go make disciples of all the nations, teaching them everything I commanded. It is not your job to save people. It's not your job to rescue people from hell. It's Jesus' job, and he defeated death and Hades. So our job is to share the love of God. So this book 
It's called Speaking of Jesus. Now, I don't agree with everything in this book, so when I pass out a book, it doesn't mean I agree with everything. I don't like the last chapter of this book, to be honest with you. I think he was trying to unite, but he actually divided. But moving forward, I'm gonna lay out some books that you have to read. And if you don't want to, then don't do it. You're still welcome here, because at Zootown, here's what we believe. Love God, love people. Love God, love people. And we're never even close to perfecting that yet, my friends. Okay? So I'm done defending. This is what I believe is the faith handed down to us. Now, here's the goal. The goal is not to catch up to Scott, because I have not arrived. We all stand together equally. Red, yellow, black, and white, they are precious in his sight. And we all marvel at the creator of the cosmos. And this is going to, I've been praying, this is going to ignite something in the faith of our church. It's going to ignite something in you guys. Because I haven't arrived. There's people that I look up to. One of them's Chuck Morlock at our church. I love Chuck. He's just a good old boy, and I love him. And last spring, he found out that he had cancer, and he just finished up with 44 radiation treatments. And when I walked up to him, and with tears in my eyes, I was like, bro, I'm so sorry. He goes, oh, Jesus has got this. And I was like, you're not even kind of nervous? He's like, no, Jesus has got this. And I'm like, I want that. Because you can throw all the theology out the window. You can throw all the right wing and left wing politics out the window. You can throw little America, who's only been around for 200 years, out the window. I want faith. I want trust and I want confidence. And so we're all growing into this. So let me just say this too. I'm all for your success. I want your success in all facets of your life, in your marriage, your children, your finances. I want your success. But Jesus was very clear. He said, seek the kingdom first, and all these things are added to you. Seek the kingdom first. I love what Brian Zahn says. He says, faith is not a feeling. Faith is not working something up in you. Faith is not saying the right words. Faith is not empirical proof. Faith is action based on that which is revealed to the heart. It's Jesus revealing these things. And as we seek Jesus, as we, as we keep moving forward and forward and forward, more revelation comes through Jesus Christ. Ephesians is a great book you all should read because it talks so much about the depth and the mystery of God. But I love this. He prayed this to the, the church of Ephesus. He goes, and I believe the, the word is living and active. And so therefore, this prayer still applies to you, friends. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. We're always trying to fill our head full of facts. I pray your heart is enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the boundless greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and presidents and COVID and Taliban and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. I want that. I want that kind of confidence. I want that kind of insight. I want my eyes to see that. So again, we're gonna go to the early church from about 700 AD back. And I hear people ask me great questions. They're like, why, why, why is it so important to go back to the early church? I feel like it should be self-evident, but here's a great quote from Thomas Merton. Thomas Merton was asked, why are you obsessed with the early church fathers? And he said this, if for some reason it were necessary for you to drink a pint of water taken out of the Mississippi River and you could choose where it was to be drawn out of the river, would you take a pint from the source of the river in Minnesota or from the estuary at New Orleans? Get it? And by the way, we have the cleanest water because the Missouri is what flows into there. But anyways, I would rather have it from the source I'm not against Charles Spurgeon. The guy didn't know Greek, okay? I'm not against some of these American preachers. They weren't trained in a, a, a full view of the church. They're trained in a Western evangelical mindset. I wanna go to the source. You know why? They were there. They saw it with their own eyes. They were there. 
So I called it Into the Mystery because that's a theme that Paul uses. And wonder is, and mystery is what keeps us seeking. As soon as we're like, well, we got this figured out, we're kind of done growing. I'll tell you something that happened to me, right? Like, I've never cared about birds ever, right? <laughs> My wife loves birds. She's feeding every bird in the neighborhood, and there's crap all over our driveway. It's wonderful. But... The other day I was walking out and I was going to my truck or my car and I was like, I was just thinking about my day and I, these birds were going crazy in these bushes. And they're like little kids. You ever notice how when you get a bunch of little kids together, they all talk at the same time? I'm like, how are any of you listening to any of this? And I just kind of stopped as I got to the end and I was like, these birds are God's worship session every morning. And I just sat there and listened to them. How did that happen? How did I become a bird guy? <laughs> because I went into the mystery. I went into the, uh, the deeper knowledge of God, and now everything seems like worship to me. Everything. That's what happens. This is why this is beautiful to continue to seek and seek and seek. We had Paul Young here a couple of weeks ago, the author of The Shack, and some people hate him. Some people, they call him a heretic. My friends call him a heretic. They've never met him. They've never met him. And so yes, he wrote a book called The Shack, and you can read The Shack, but when you meet him, The Shack takes on a whole new light because you start seeing some of those stories through his eyes and through his experience. The Bible is the same way, my friends. Paul said, the letter of the law kills, but the spirit gives life. A fundamentalist reading of the Bible will kill the spirit because there's this whole other spiritual realm that's happening behind it. And seeking the mystery is not just knowing the book. The book does not save you. Your facts do not save you. Your theological degrees do not save you. It says in the, this same book that my people die from a lack of knowledge. This book is leading you to the author. To the author. This book is the starting point, not the ending point. Jesus Christ did not close the book of Revelation and say, well, I'm done talking. Good luck, guys. He's still speaking, he's speaking, he's speaking, he's speaking. This is the beginning of the conversation. One of my favorite verses in Revelation 3.20, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him, into him, and will dine with him and he with me. Some of you are afraid of the Father. Some of you are afraid of Jesus. Because you think, well, if I let him in, he's just going to like call this out and call that out and call this out. He doesn't say that there. He goes, I'm going to have a dinner with you. I'm going to eat with you. In Jewish culture, if you ate with someone, you were saying, they're with me. So that's why when Jesus was eating and drinking with the reputable sinners and everyone was upset, what he was saying was, they're on my side and I'm on their side. Jesus is on your side. And the seeking and the mystery and the keep moving forward is him eating with you and dining with you. What is obvious to me is that every single person on the planet is seeking for something. We're all looking for a tribe. That's why all these different tribes keep coming up that we think we have to join, and all these different religions. But here's what we need to know. It's not us seeking, it's we're being sought after by the creator of the universe. Here's one of the problems with things that I've said. I always say Jesus meets you where you're at. He absolutely does. There's no sin, there's no situation, there's nothing you're in that Jesus isn't right here with you because he lives inside of us, the Christ who lives in you. So Jesus absolutely meets you where you're at. But the problem with that is sometimes we just stay there then and he's like, no, I wanna move you forward. I wanna move you forward in this faith. I wanna move you forward in your life. And so I think when he says, I knock at the door, it's not a one-time thing. This is an everyday thing. When you wake up, when you go to sleep, he's just knocking and knocking and knocking. My grandpa had that beautiful old painting hanging right next to his lazy boy, and it was the painting of Jesus standing at the door knocking. It's an everyday thing. That's the mystery. That's the growth. That's the keep moving forward. My friend Baxter Kruger says, I've had, I've had a salvation moment. And he goes, I've had many salvation moments. And I hope I have more. Throughout our life, it's not just a one-time thing. Paul says, you are saved, you are being saved, and you will be saved. It's the spiritual realm, the kingdom realm. And so I love how Paul says that, right? He, Paul keeps saying that because this isn't a one-time thing. This isn't a sinner's prayer one-time thing. That was a great moment, but it's an everyday kind of thing. 
let me put it this way. My wife and I love to go out and eat together. And what if I just would have went out to dinner with her just so I could marry her, and then I was like, yeah, we're done with dates. I got you. I won you. Does that sound like an incredibly healthy relationship to you? So why do we keep going on dates? Because we haven't even figured each other out yet. Men and women are different. Have you noticed that, anybody? So we go on dates, and we go on dates. We used to go to restaurants, um, not to put any restaurants down, but we didn't have any money when we first got married. Now, we like to taste new food. We went to 1889 and got a steak for $785. <laughs> it wasn't that much, but good Lord, right? <laughs> we wanna try new foods. We wanna eat together in different places. So now we have a little more money, so now we can go to better places. Jesus is the same with you. He starts out with, here's the bread, here's the blood. And as you grow and you seek and you seek, he's like, I'm ready. are you ready for that tomahawk steak yet? And a lot of us say, you know what, I'm just good with grilled cheese. Now, nothing against grilled cheese, because no, some of you are like, I'm out. Trash and grilled cheese now. But there's more, and there's more, and there's more. This is what eating with Jesus looks like. But here's the thing. The psalmist says, the earth is his and the fullness thereof. You are his. I love when people say to me, Scott, man, we need revival in Missoula because Jesus has taken this place back. And I'm like, oh, that's cute because Missoula's already his. It's already his. He called you the temple of the living God. You're not brick and mortar. You house the spirit of God, the high priest of the cosmos. And that's why I believe hell is also inside of us. You can bring out heaven or you can bring out hell. Your choice but Jesus owns this house. And so when he knocks and you let him in, here's the scary part, but here's where mystery's great. You have to let go of control because if he owns the house, maybe he's like, okay, I wanna move that sofa over there. And you're like, yeah, but I've had it there since 1989. He's like, I know. <laughs> so we keep him at a distance. You know what the safest place to hide from Jesus is? Religion. Boom, 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 boom. He owns the house. And so we have to give up this control, but that's the fun of it. He starts moving things around and you start changing your view on stuff. My dear sister at this church, I'll give her a little plug, Kelsey Park, love her. She has the gift from God of organization. It's crazy. Like once a month, I just need to call her and bring her into the office and be like, what do we need to do, sister? Because she just has this gift. She can look at something and say, the cereal should go there. I'm like, what do you mean? Not in the bag crumpled up underneath the counter? That's not where it's supposed to go? but we hire her because she's gifted at it and she, when we give up control to her, we say, okay, this is your thing. Where do you want us to put it? It's this, but there is a giving up of control. You're inviting her into your house to change things. Jesus is the same way. But that's where seeking, that's where mystery comes in. So I'm pretty much gonna just quote all early church fathers because they're geniuses, okay? <laughs> they're geniuses. And Augustine said this, by expectation, God increases desire. This desire you feel is from God. By desire, he empties out souls. In emptying them out, he makes them more capable of receiving him. Hasten to the springs drawn from the wells. In God is the wellspring of life, a spring that can never fail. In his light is found a light that nothing can darken. Desire the light which your eyes know not. Your inward eye is preparing to see the light. Your inward thirst burns to be quenched at the spring. That is such deep, rich stuff when you meditate on it. So why did the early church explode? They had a kingdom focus. They gave up everything, and these guys were geniuses. They were trained in the schools of philosophy in Greece. I mean, like, these are geniuses. And then they met Christ, and they blended that wisdom together. But they were willing to give up everything for this because they actually believed in the kingdom, the kingdom. So I, I'm just, I'm, I'm a little tired of hearing this. I've probably said it too. My entire life, I've heard Christians say, this is not our home. We're made for another place. I don't think we believe that because we're sure fighting hard to keep it. We're willing to use violence. We're willing to use politics. We're really willing to use anything to keep this place. But we're like, but this isn't our home. 
Yes, it is our home because it says Jesus is redeeming this planet and you and I have an opportunity to be a part of the redemption of this planet. That's real faith. And that's what the early church did. Last week, we had a vision service. Um, we canceled early morning service. Sorry if you didn't show up. Uh, we had a vision service. It was great. So thank you so much for making that a priority. Thank you. We're gonna do more of them because I know that not everyone can make them, but we're gonna do more of those. But we shared vision. We talked about tribes. We talked about how you can serve at the church, all these great things. But I'm gonna tell you, the kingdom moment, the best moment of that night actually happened in that parking lot with the food truck guy. The food truck guy showed up and his partner bailed on him or was sick. And he had a line of about 100 some people, one guy cooking fish and chips. And you could just see it on him. So I turned around, I said, everybody show this guy some grace. He's all alone. Here's the beauty of it. Brandy, Dan DeLong's wife, got in the truck and said, teach me how to take orders, you cook. And she served our church by taking orders. And he was about to leave, he said, because he was so rattled and he just said, your church is so awesome. Your church was so kind. Your church was so compassionate. I ran out of food and they tipped me really well. My dear friends, that's the kingdom. That's the kingdom. Not all this theology. I love theology, I love it. I, I'm addicted to it. But that's the kingdom. That's what we're about. One man writes, the kingdom of God is in the present moment. We don't need to die in order to enter into the kingdom of God. In fact, we have to be very much alive. With a mindful breath, with a step taken mindfully, we can enter the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is now or never. Here's the problem with the American dream. It's always waiting for something else to happen. It's always waiting for a future event. I guess the American dream is we all just retire then die. Is that it? It's always the next thing. It's when I get this. It's when I have that. It's when I get this. It's when I have that. Now, I'm not against it. I have an IRA, okay? But it seems like it's always the next thing. As soon as my kids get out of high school, as soon as they get into college, as soon as I get this. The kingdom of God is now. It's now. Jesus knocks today. He knocks now. And I'm, I'm tired of living for the, like when COVID's done. I'm tired of living for 2024. I'm tired. I'm I want to live now. I want to live now. Go back to the dinners, right? One of the saddest things to me is when I go out to dinner and I see a couple there and they're on their phones the entire time not talking to each other. That, that saddens me. Something has happened to us. We don't want to live in the present. We don't want to deal with things in our life. So we're constantly living out here or right here. It's bizarre to me how you can go out with your spouse or with a friend and you're with somebody else. Something's happened. Something's happened in our souls. We're, we're constantly trying to push things away. You ask any lawyer at our church, divorce has skyrocketed during the COVID season. But you want to know why? I believe it's because it actually exposed a problem that was there for a long time. It just, they were forced to deal with it. And you know what it exposed? Busyness. Busyness. We're always moving, always moving, always moving. The mystery is beautiful, and it's a daily pursuit. It's a daily pursuit of Christ and him pursuing you. And the beauty is we're called the bride of Christ, and he is our groom, and he promises I will never leave you or forsake you or divorce you, ever. But this is a daily pursuit. And so this is why sometimes we get in these spots where our faith just seems so wild. Well, it's the same way when you get divorced. It's kind of like, and again, I'm, I'm big paintbrush I'm using right now. Your story might be different. But it, it forces you to all of a sudden really deal with the problem. Jesus is our groom, and daily He's working on us in this way. Let me show you something cool, because this is what I mean by the lens of America in English that sometimes we take to verses. Hebrews 12. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Right there, that word discipline, we're like, uh, uh, like he's got a switch, right? God's just ready to, uh, he's gonna beat the sin out of us, right? That's kind of what we think sometimes. Here's the cool thing. That Greek word means to draw out with education. 
It's the same Latin word we get education from. It means to draw something out. So God's discipline isn't whack, whack, whack. God's discipline is enlightenment in your mind. It's enlightenment in your soul. It's drawing things out through education, not through coercion, not through anger, not through wrath, through education. So that's the beauty of seeking these things, diving deep into some of these concepts is because it draws this stuff out of you. Mystery is the teacher that's drawing things out of the depths of your soul to live with peace and success in Jesus Christ our Lord. I love this spot in Luke 17. It says, now he was questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming. And he answered them and said, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs that can be observed. Wow. That kind of throws out a lot of American theology. Look, here it is, or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. He's like, live now, live now. The kingdom of God is now. And the Pharisees thought, you know why they missed Jesus, their own Messiah? Is because the Jewish people thought the Messiah was gonna come with a sword and he was gonna wipe out Rome. I'm gonna do a whole uh, sermon on this once, but Barabbas, when Barabbas and Jesus were on the platform together with Pilate, they chose Barabbas because he was an insurrectionist, violent man, and they wanted a violent man to take out Rome. And here's the issue. Now, the kingdom of God is kind of hard for us, so we're waiting for Jesus, the violent man, to come back and fix it. That is not the gospel. That is not the kingdom of God. He is saying it's in your midst. You're not gonna be able to see this sign because it's spiritual. There's this whole other thing going on. Can't you tell right now, all of you know this, all of you know this, there is a spiritual battle going on in the world right now. The apostle Paul said, the battle is not with flesh and blood. And so what do we do? It's the liberals' fault. It's the conservatives' fault. It's the gay people's fault. It's their fault. He's like, it's not flesh and blood. There is a spiritual battle happening in our world right now. And seeking the mystery helps you tap in so you see the thing behind the thing. Check this out. This blew my mind. In 2020, they just reported, um, for, I think it was Harvard. I can't, I, it might have been Harvard. Nine of the 20 top Christian websites that Christians look at were actually run by trolls from other countries. And they've been using, filling Christian websites with propaganda, with fear, with division, with false information to get us divided. People who aren't following Jesus in other countries know us Americans fall for it because we're always looking for a sign to get us off focus from the kingdom of God. We've all believed some nonsense, all of us. Again, I'm gonna unpack this later on, but here's what happened. I know this is hard, but most of what we've been given is about 200 years old. It started with a guy named Darby who invented the rapture and invented dispensationalism and Schofield who made it a Schofield Bible and he basically, gets, they created this whole new theology saying you can map out things. Jesus said, don't look for a sign. He said, the sign has been given you, the kingdom of God within you. I know that's tough, but a lot of the things we were raised with are wrong. It's a dispensationalist viewpoint. But seeking the mystery makes the kingdom a reality. I had this great moment a couple weeks ago in my garage as I was breaking things. <laughs> I don't know if you're, I don't know, maybe we're different. I'm so tired of everything breaking in my house. Right? My grandma has the same washer from the 60s. And then Maytag figured it out. They're like, wow, we're not selling very many washers. So now let's make them five years and charge eight times as much. My, my, my fridge in my garage is probably 30 years old. It works better than the brand new one in my house. I'm so sick of things breaking. And I'm having this temper tantrum in my garage. And I'm breaking stuff in my garage. I'll confess it. And Jesus, I heard Jesus so clearly. He goes, I told you so. And he wasn't mean, he just kind of smirked. He was like, don't blame me, man. I told you, the more stuff you have, the more it breaks. 
in Matthew 6. He said, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He's like, 2,000 years ago, I knew you'd be breaking this microwave in your garage for this moment. He's right. This, and this is the opposite of the American prosperity preaching. It just is. And we've been, all been lured by it, and then we're mad when stuff breaks. It's like Jesus knew my Ford was gonna be in the shop every stinking month. Oh, now you need this chip. Oh, they don't make that chip anymore. You gotta wait three months. And it's just like, <laughs> And Jesus is like, yeah, this sucks, right? They didn't have that problem when they were just pulling a donkey. <laughs> just had to feed it. Look, I want you guys to enjoy your life. I want you to make money. I want you to do well. My family and I bought a camper five years ago. It changed our family life. But never in my deepest, darkest despair have I thought, well, at least I have a camper. <laughs> I'm serious. The more I seek the mystery, the more I long for Christ, and the more those things don't matter. It really doesn't. If you get them, you get them. If you don't, you don't. I love my kids now. I love my God now. And I just want to break out of this American cycle, and I just want to follow God in the kingdom of God, and that's where the power will come from. Dallas Willard says, the gospel is less about how to get into the kingdom of heaven after you die, and more about how to live in the kingdom of heaven before you die. What are we seeking? Where's our treasure? How's our soul? Let me bring this together. Goals are good. They're great. I have lots of goals. If they happen, they happen. If they don't, they don't. But let's get out of our minds right now that you're going to arrive somewhere. You're never going to arrive, okay? Never. The early church believed that God was so big and he's so mysterious and he's so loving that it's not like we have this life here and then make it to heaven and we stop. They believed for all eternity we keep going up and God keeps surprising us and we keep learning more about God. But the thing about the kingdom of God is if you know Jesus, Jesus never said, I give you the truth. He said, I am the truth. He never said, I give you life. He says, I am the life. So the more you seek this life, the more you can start now on this planet going up. I respect and I admire the early church fathers because they found something. They found it. So let me say, salvation is a free gift. I will not give in any longer to the American version of the gospel that says, yes, it's free, but you have to do this, 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 and this, and believe this and this. No, Jesus Christ went into death, he went into Hades, and he defeated it, and he forgave us on the cross once and for all. The first step is believing that, but I think one of Satan's biggest tricks is to get us questioning our salvation all the time. Am I saved? I did this. Am I not saved? So then you stay in this little spot when Jesus is like, I did it. And when you get past that and you can start really getting into some of these deep things, it just opens up a world that you didn't even know. Olivia Clement says this, so then God offers himself, wishes to disclose himself, but he does not force us. His power is the power of love, and love wants the freedom of the beloved. God speaks and at the same time keeps silent. He knocks at the door and waits. Everything, now listen to this, everything depends upon the royal freedom of faith. Everything hangs upon our decision. He is not talking about our decision for Christ one time so we get a get out of hell free card. He's talking about a daily decision to continually seek him and lay our questions before him and lay our families before him and lay our sins before him and he just keeps taking us up and up and up. So let's be real. I think social media and television and sports, all those things are good, but it has proven that seeking Jesus doesn't come from a lack of time. It's not a lack of time. It takes purpose, purposeful pursuit. And he says it will empty you. And I'm telling you, I'm getting more and more empty. The older I get, the less I know. But I know him. I've never believed this message more than I do right now because Jesus says when you carry your cross, when you empty yourself, when you die to this world, you find life. You find it. We 
have a role in this. You can sit on your porch, in your car, whatever it is. It takes a pursuit. There's moments when my mornings are like, and I get to the gym, and I'm about to get out of my truck to, get into the, to go to the gym, and I hear the Spirit say, uh, can we talk for just a minute? You're gonna go build up those muscles, but you haven't even taken time to build up this soul yet. And I'll just sit in my truck and just sit there in silence until I'm ready to go. It works. I'm telling you, this works. Gregory of Nyssa, you're gonna hear a lot about him. He's my favorite early church father. He wrote the Nicene Creed uh, at the Seventh Ecumenical Council. They named him the father of fathers. They said, this is the guy. And he writes this. Here, in the spiritual realm, birth is not the result of intervention from outside, as happens with bodily creatures who reproduce in external ways. Spiritual birth is the result of free choice. And we are thus, in a sense, our own parents, creating ourselves as we want to be, freely fashioning ourselves according to the pattern of our choice. Is what we're going through now bringing life? Is masks, vaccines, politics, is this really bringing life, friends? Because you are a spirit. You are a body, with, you are a spirit with a body, as C.S. Lewis said. You are not a body with a spirit. You are a spirit with a body. And the more we feed this and the more we seek this and the more we go after it, the more peace we have. There's this whole other kingdom waiting, my friends. I'm just starting to tap into it. That's why Jesus said it's a seed that's buried. You don't see it, but it grows. It's a treasure that's buried and you give everything up for it. It's light in the darkness. And that's what we're gonna discover. So in this series, we're gonna cover some basics of the faith. But the mystery is what brings it alive. The mystery, not the fundamentalist, just point, you know, point by point Bible thing. There's this whole other spirit behind it. So we're gonna look at, it's gonna be practical too. I'm gonna go through what the church is. Why, do, why are we here? The second one, I'm gonna go through communion. I've realized I've been a pastor for 12 years, 13 years, and I've never explained why we take communion. Pastor of the year, you guys, pastor of the year. What we do is very important. This is incredibly important, and the early church saw this as big time important. This is the body in the blood of Jesus Christ. This is so important. Now, here's where I break from the early church. I invite everyone to the communion table because I think Jesus ate with everyone. You see it in the Gospels. You don't have to do anything to take communion. You don't have to be confirmed. You don't have to, whatever. They were building the church. I'm just glad you're here. I don't care if you're gay, straight, black, white, whatever you are, I'm never gonna put anything in between you and receiving the grace of God. All are welcome to our communion table. Because I love it, Zacchaeus, right? He goes up to Zacchaeus, he's like, hey, I'm coming over to your house tonight. <laughs> he wasn't like, have you been confirmed? <laughs> right? So we're gonna look at communion, we're gonna look at prayer. Prayer's tough, we're gonna look at it. You can judge me if you want, but some of my best prayers have had swear words in it. Because it's honest. It's honest. We're gonna look at what, how they prayed, we're, and then finally we're gonna look at the difficult path of carrying your cross. Following Jesus is hard. It just is. I wanna be clear, I'm not putting pressure on you. This isn't religion. This isn't for you to feel bad if you miss a morning session. Whatever, I'm not doing that. I'm giving you freedom to go to the source of your creation, to go to the depths of your soul and the darkness of things that this world has put in and lies have put in. And you've been beat up by the world. You've been beat up by family members. You've been beat up by the spiritual realm. We all have trauma. This is why I wanna show tons of grace to people, especially for the next five years, because one, COVID's not over. We all have PTSD, you guys. One minute we're planning our Mexico vacation. Next minute we're locked in our house. We all have PTSD, but we have to come to grips with our souls, and I'm giving you freedom to seek the depths of your soul with your Savior, Jesus Christ. Here's the beauty that I'm finding. You don't just find God, you find yourself. You find yourself. You, it's, you, I don't mind saying no to things now. I'm like, nah, no offense to you, but I'm with Jesus. That's not what Jesus has for me. You don't have to be a people pleaser. You don't have to conform to social media and their view. You don't have to conform to a political party. You don't have to conform to anything. You find out who God is in your life and how he's created you in the object of the Trinity. Band, you can come on up. I had this amazing moment with, after my sabbatical. 
I, I took some time off just to really nail down where I'm at and just, I just needed Jesus to minister to my soul. The week I got back to church, I was miserable. And that's not you guys. I couldn't wait to preach. But it went from sitting with Jesus for hours to then emails and nah, nah, you know, right? And I was like, Lord, what's wrong with me? Did I do something wrong in this one week? And I realized I was homesick. I was homesick. I just spent so much time, hours and hours in prayer and meditation and reading and silence. And I realized he is life. You don't have anything without him. He is life. And you try to put it here and you try to put it there and you try to put it there. And I love this. I love how cool Jesus is. Like, if you don't want to go, he won't go. He'll just be like, well, we can wait. I got all eternity. But you do play a role in this. And you can go as far as you want in this life with Christ and just digging deep into these things. And that's the mystery. So there are 3.8 million people leaving the church every single year in America. We got into power. I mean, gosh. <laughs> there's abuse. There's religion. I mean, you, you say one wrong thing, you're a heretic. You're, I mean, were you ever really saved? It's messed up. But this is an opportunity to get back to the faith and the roots of what was handed down to us, what cost our Savior his life to birth. John Climacus, St. John, says, hunger makes itself felt only gradually and vaguely, but the raging of intense thirst is unmistakable and intolerable. No wonder the person who longs for God cries, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Maybe this is how some of you feel. You're thirsty. And you've tried this, and you've tried that, and you've tried this, and you've tried that. Let's try the simple faith of just belief. Just believe. Believe he did what he said he did. Believe that he loves you no matter what. Believe that he has forgiven you. And start there. But that thirst is this longing that's never gonna go away because it's for God, the creator of all things. And I love in Philippians, it says this. Paul said this. Brothers and sisters, I do not regard myself as having taken hold of it yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I love this line. Therefore, all who are mature, let's have this attitude. And if anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that to you as well. What freedom. Well, we might not agree, but God's gonna reveal it to you. It's all good. However, let's keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. That is my prayer in my heart for myself, for this church. And so we're gonna take communion. This is the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. And the reason we line it up here now is because you're honoring those in front of you that they are worthy of grace and you are worthy of grace and you're worthy together. But I'm also gonna do something different today. Also, don't forget to get that book. Also, don't forget to go out and look at the teams and the tribes because that's all a part of it. The tribes is being together as a church and hearing the voice of Jesus. That's what it is. But I believe in prayer. I, I really believe in prayer. I believe in the anointing oil. I believe in this. And I don't have special powers. It's actually just faith and trust. And we had someone, uh, he shared this story with me that when I did this like a, a year ago or a couple years ago, him and his wife were at their wits end. Like they didn't know what to do with their finances, with their careers, they were struggling. They had sold their other business. They didn't know what to do. And he said, we just walked up and just asked you to pray for wisdom. And I prayed for them. And he said, everything turned around after that day. And he said, God led us to this new career. He led us to this new path, this new business venture. And he goes, it's just booming. And it was one simple act of faith. So again, I'm gonna stand right here. If you need prayer, if you want prayer, if you just want a blessing, whatever it is, it's not me. I don't have special powers, okay? It's just, it's doing something. It's the faith lived out. And it's a daily reminder of God's grace.
I'm excited to go into the mystery with you all. And my, I'm always open for questions. You can email me whatever you need to do. I'm open for questions. So I love you guys. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.